Welcome everyone. I'd like to thank um, Kate and Ella for um, putting on the show as well as um, all, all the jewellery and for their uh, lovely welcome. Um, so the, the topic, what are jewellery materials? And obviously this could be answered, um, particularly looking around in the show, what aren't jewellery materials? But if we did that, we could all just pack up and go home because the questions sit on the wall. So obviously today we really are, are, are interested in looking at what, what material, how material, the importance material plays in the cre in creative acts. Um, so, so really interested in, you know, uh, material as collaborator, um, very much interested in how jewellery materials are not only seen as objects, but also seen as encounters. And so we're, we're, we're going to try today to uh, un unpack some of these um, issues around material in contemporary jewellery. And so, and, and around this idea of how we choose materials, how we use materials, and the consequences material play uh, in our actions, in contemporary jewellery, in our culture and how they make us as human beings. So, so materials are pretty important as far as we're concerned. So interrogating these questions, I'd like to introduce our panel. So Michaela Pegum, Louise Weaver, Kirsten Hayden, Yufang Chi, Nicholas Baston, Susie Adderwell, Helen Britton, Barbara Bolt and Michael Trudgeon. So our panel of experts um, um, are, are going to um, begin today by um, briefly, um, what they're going to do is, I've asked them all to bring a material, they're going to um, present that material to you in, in a form of a statement and just about what we're looking at. Um, then they're going to ask questions to the panel who are go then going to discuss um, uh, the questions that they've answered. So we're going to work you know, quite structurally and systematically. Everyone gets six minutes each. Um, we have our little roving cam camera so you can get close-ups of the materials. And we're also <laughs> going to get um, uh, visual clues through um, text, because text is also um, a vi you know, part of a material for contemporary jewellery as well. So I'd like to uh, in start with Susie Adderall. Um, thanks, Mark. Uh, well, I'm not, I'm not going to follow what you just laid out. <laughs> so that's kind of... Um, and also to question the question uh, around what are jewellery materials. I don't like what questions. They always sort of seek to identify and come up with an answer. And then, you know, a bit like this exhibition here, to sort of really challenge that. I guess with um, my own practice and also just being involved in practice re research, I think the better questions are like, like questions like how. How are jewellery materials? And probably it's like, how is material jewellery? I would like to ask. And also, perhaps, when is material jewellery? And also, where is material jewellery? Um, and I want to just show you a couple of things that I brought in and um, then throw it open to discussion from there. So, OK, I'll, I'll grab this. So, I've got a few things in my quick six minutes. Oh, in my tunic, right? So, oh God, <laughs> this is my ear. I can't really see it, but hang on. Oh, I don't know, but yeah, do yeah, do my yeah. ear. So this is a Mark Edgoose earring, and um, it's 20, 22 karat gold. But I just found out that there's sterling silver sort there of encased in it. <laughs> and so, from there, I'd just like to then sort of move to this. This is a. Uh, Otto Kunzli's gold, I'm not going to get this coordinated, gold makes you blind. It's rubber, and apparently there's gold inside. Then there's Susan Conn's um, skim, Susan Conn in mourning rings. These are, when I got them, they were black anodized aluminium, and now they're just aluminium. And then this is um, a piece of jewellery by Alex Murray Leslie. Ruby ring. No, I'm not going to take it off. <laughs> <laughs> and then my final bit is, is this. Can I? It's very hard to do. Do you mind just putting? Is that. And that's Warwick Freeman jeweler in New Zealand, and this is the only piece that I own of his, and I love it. If you know his work, he works very much with um, materials from around where he lives 
in um, you know timber and stone and so on. But you know, I bought this at Gallery Fanaki, and this is um, a work. And the reason why I love it is because it's a star, and it's very sort of it's 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 the form that he works with a lot. But it's from um, an exhibition that he had called Owner's Manual. And apparently, if you put your fingers together like this, well, no, not apparently, if you do, and hold it up to the sky, then you have your own star and, as a, a, and piece of sky. So for me, that's also jewelry material. So my questions are more around how, when, and where is, jewel is, is material jewelry. Okay, who's going to dive in? It's a really big question. <laughs> <laughs> but I suppose, in a way, like this, this, you know, like these are all provocations to me because, I mean, I think this is really ruby ring, is very interesting from Alex Murray Leslie. It was an exhibition that was at Gallery Fanaki in late 1990s, and it was part of Melbourne Fashion Festival, and there was, you know, a parade up and down Crosley Street. And it sort of reminds me of when I went to um, the VCA around probably, you know, a little bit earlier and um, looking, you know, curating an exhibition and going into the painting studio and there's no paintings. <laughs> there's no paintings being done at that time. But still, students were studying and doing painting, you know? And so I think it's, it, it's, it's quite interesting then, From the kind of... Yeah. And the techniques yeah. and the concerns and the histories yeah. and, the, and, and making, making a kind of contribution to that. This, mm. is, this is a contribution to jewellery practice. Mm. So true. And, you know, it's a piece of jewellery. When, and when I put it on as well, great. I feel like I'm wearing a piece yeah, of jewellery. How does it make you feel? Because ruby ring, like it's both looking at the way the words... Um, appear like their yeah. their construction. It's the font. It's the colour because it's not a true ruby red colour necessarily. But then, how do you describe the colour? And then people's perception of colour. How I've they I've also got it on around my body. Yes, mm. you know I feel it. Mm. It's ringing. It's ringing, ringing my your body. Torso. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Well, all your examples of material um, are attached to your body. Yep. Mm. So um, mm. you as collaborator. Uh, with with material, is that something you see as um, you know, f formative in the fact of what what is a jewelry material? Um, no, I think yeah, not so much as a collaborator. I mean, I'm sort of um, more interested in the how, mm. and so you know, like is is this you know with ruby ring on, and then the fact that I'm wearing it, you know, that becomes mm. how it becomes mm. jewelry. Do you think you know and I guess, yeah, that, that sort of question of when it's also not on. Mm. Susie, do you think it's a response to, you know, what the ideas around what jewellery can be? So it, yeah. can be diff it can be all different things. Mm. Yeah. But what's interesting about every piece that you've shown is they're all made by contemporary jewellers. Mm -hmm. They're all trained as I contemporary took, jewellers. actually took off all my other so, jewellery. Yeah, so you've really... Mm. You've really honed in on the fact that mm. it's not a piece that your grandmother gave you. It's yep. they're all mm. really personal pieces to your choice mm. of um, work relating to. Yeah. Well, I guess it comes back to Mark's question around collaborator. Can mm. I just? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 There's no point in asking. You're going to do it anyway. So. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's trans. It transforms me. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So it's not a collaboration, it's actually putting something on that makes me think about, you know, mm. this material then becoming jewellery, engaging in that kind of practice and discourse mm. and being transformed by it. I mean, yeah, so it's not, it's not you know, that might... Pause the camera down. Yeah, it's a provocation to, yeah. to think about those things. Mm. Yeah. So it's a, it's a nice question. I took my Fitbit off. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. So, um, Michaela. Hi, everybody. Um, this is not my material. It's a Sagar container, and it's used in ceramic firing processes. Um, but this is my material. Oh, inside. Um, 
And this is the ash that's formed, um, that's produced in the sagar when you fire um, pieces inside it. And the ash is usually thrown away and discarded because its job is to colour the ceramic pieces. So these are some terracotta um, test pieces that have been stained black all the way through by the ash. But I'm actually really interested in the ash as a material in itself. Um, so I think it's really beautiful. Um, and my question, my first question is, how does this material, this ash, affect you? So the effective qualities of the material. Mm. So how does it make you feel? Um, psychologically, emotionally, and physically as well. And then the second question um, is how might it be further transformed and worked with to find another form or another presence? And it's already started that process. It's been through a lot. It has. Yeah. <laughs> so originally it was a um, part of a branch from my front garden and then a handful of sawdust to help with the combustion. And what kind of tree was it? Was it a, a native tree or was it I an introduced species? Or? It's an introduced, it's an mm. old tree. I do know the Latin name. That's okay. Fraxinus <laughs> excelsior. Ooh, <and> it <laughs> <laughs> certainly <laughs> does. I think that's, I think that's right. <laughs> um, yeah. So sorry. was the tree itself very significant as part of this process or was it... Co um, collecting refuse that was yeah, extended? I think it, it was important for me to sort of collect mm. something that was, mm. that I had some feeling for or mm. connection with. Um, yeah, but now it could be anything, you know, mm. like sort of. And even just arranged in the way that you have, it's already in the state of becoming something. Yeah, that's right. Mm. Yeah. It's interesting, one of um, the first, as you unwrapped it, as you laid it out, mm. the first thing was, um, and you said, how does it feel? Yeah. But mm. we don't necessarily think about taste. And the first thing in my mouth was the grit of the, the mm. grit of it, the, oh, the kind great. of taste. Mm. Um, and I'm not sure that when we think about jewellery, we always think about mm. that taste Mm. Um, or even mm. perhaps hearing. But that, for me, is what would be important. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and we certainly think about the senses and the tangible and mm. touch in, in jewellery, so that's, uh, that, that's something mm. that really comes, comes across. So, yeah, very interesting, the taste of jewellery, yeah. Mm. They're out there. The grit, in, yeah. the grit in your mouth. Yeah. Mm. Like you know, it's an internal rather yeah. than an external yeah. and a, a sensation. You put a spoon in your mouth. You know, and the, the taste of that as, as, as an object, you know, um, yeah. is an interesting sort of way of looking at uh, the effect of material. Yeah, mm. yeah. Exactly. And do you feel like you want it, that's something you want to do? Put no, it it's a very <laughs> awkward. <laughs> but you're very it's awkward. It's right. Um, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. But that is what's so intriguing because that creates a tension yeah. that in itself isn't present necessarily in the state that it's in yeah. on the paper you're creating like a narrative almost about what the cause and effect of this material could create as yeah. well. Mm. Mm. I couldn't help but think about just the state of fire that is necessary for that as a catalyst to yeah. occur. Mm. Mm. Yes. Mm. Mm. And if you hadn't told me that it was wood, I could have believed that it was any number of materials as well. And yeah. then whether it leans towards melancholy or yeah. <laughs> uh, celebration or like it creates when you said about mm. what psychological effect does it have on you or mm. can it possibly create, then there's sorts of things that I'd be thinking about, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or positively. Yeah. <laughs> I was wondering whether that would be mm. an immediate association, the idea mm. of, um, yeah, things passing and the... Um, or because you drew it out of something that could equally be a sarcophagus almost, yeah. or, a <laughs> or an urn, yeah. urn or <laughs> yep. then it was a performance of something that you're kind of the expectation of what it could be as well. Mm. Yeah, yep. Mm. So how about further transformations? Well, Does anyone have ideas around? You go. I have a few ideas. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was wondering 
I mean, it's really carbon in some ways, isn't mm. it? It's mm. sort of, you know, come to carbon and um, carbon makes diamonds and things like that. So, um, so, tr so space sort of, travels yeah, into the yeah, future. So, so <laughs> ash, ash is sort of in between, mm. can be in between different um, sort of states of being in some way. And maybe, you know, um, it's that idea about ephemeral and ephemerality in work. And, um, and because I'm familiar with M Michaela's work, I know that she's worked with smoke before. So yeah. it doesn't make me feel surprised to see ash mm -hmm. as, a, um, as an element. And I think it's something that, you know, it does um, definitely relate to jewellery because it's, it's also used in so many ways within jewellery in terms of, um, you know, like the, the blocks of um, wood. Charcoal uh, The blocks. charcoal blocks and, um, and creating of, um, you know, granules and all those sorts of things. So the fact that it fires ceramics, you can also fire metal in it. Um, I'm not sure. Or mix it with, mix it with other materials. Yeah. 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 I think um, the, the other thing that it makes me think of is just, you know, the touching of it and how mm. it disperses. Mm. Yeah, maybe it's because yeah. I've got a white T-shirt on. I don't yeah. know, but yeah. but no, but just you know, like so that one, you know, is that part then of the actual material and how mm -hmm. it becomes jewelry, yeah. because you know, like always, there then this need to somehow contain it, mm -hmm. so that it doesn't start smudging everywhere. And do you know, you know, like so, it's quite interesting as a material in that way that it does, mm -hmm. it's not sort of bound to the form. Mm -hmm. Yep. Potentially, that it that it will sort of continue to spread and disperse and smudge and mark and yeah. do a whole lot of other things while it's you know in leave its trace. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and colonised as well. Things. Yeah, and I, and I also think that it's um it, it's got a future too because for me you know the notion of carbon and then I then I think you know well DNA. Mm. And then, it, for, you know, and, and then that brings me into, you know, the future and, and how that might, so it's, it's, it's transformation might be actually quite something mm. not about the, 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 you know, the material sort of indicates what it is, but it might be, you know, um, not, not, not about the actual material, you know, um, for, for, for sure. So, yeah, I think it's sort of got all those sort of um, possibilities yeah. for me anyway. Right. Okay, that's it, time. Okay, I think I stuffed up the timing, so... Um, yeah, um, I, yeah. Why, why did she get more time than me? Um, <laughs> so, so um, Yu Fang is our next um, uh, our next speaker. Hi everyone, I'm okay. Yu Fang. I bring two material. One is for audience, so you can touch, and another one is here, so everyone can play with this. Is there anyone know what's this? So is that yes. mesh? Is that mesh? Yes. I've seen it, I think. Oh, sorry. Oh, yep. Everyone can play with this. And this is come from Taiwan. And in Australia, I think it's uh, not very, people is not very familiar with this material, but pretty much in Taiwanese kitchen, everybody, everyone's home must have this. 99% people have this in our kitchen. And this is for holding the leftover of our kitchen sink. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when women cooking and after cooking they wash the dishes, we will put this in the kitchen sink. So you will hold the leftover and all the disgusting material and yeah, the hair, everything. We will hold it and prevent uh, the disgusting material going to the pipe. Did you bring one of those in? I bring One lots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and actually, I hate this when I was mm. cooking. And every time I go to throw all the garbage and everything is done, and I always forgot I still have this in my sink. Mm. So I need to pick it by my hand. And I think when I arrived in Australia five years ago, I Notice my roommates never use this. <laughs> and I think the plumper in Melbourne must be very busy. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And I realized this material is um, connected to my culture and also our lifestyle. And that brings uh, the first question. 
how can material unfold the culture story? Mm. Yeah, actually, it's just a very common daily material everywhere in Taiwan, but it actually represents different kinds of lifestyle and also our culture. And start at that time, I start to notice uh, what different from daily material and how we look at this material. And last year, Australia start to ban to use a plastic bag. Yeah, but Taiwan actually starts from 17 years ago, and it's still a huge problem in Taiwan. But I'm so curious why we start to use plastic bags 17 years ago, but this is still everywhere now. It also comes mm. also a plastic material. And I use this material to make my artwork. And I use uh, electroforming to like uh, make an ambiguous. I love form. his unwrapping of everything. <laughs> <laughs> of this. So if you like, you can play with this. And they are very soft and flexible. But my artwork is uh, very solid. So I want to play with the uh, ambi ambiguity between the material, material, and the actual artwork. And also this is a second question. How can material activate new ways of seeing and touching? Mm -hmm. And I think this question also relates to Makaya's mm -hmm. question. And I think that it's uh, how jewelry bring me to keep a focus on material and how material can bring us to think about new question and also to reflect our daily life. Mm. Yeah, and I think that's my question. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. And you, Feng, um, so uh, as far as um, the material and, and this sort of notion of culture that you talk about, what do you see your part in that? Because when we look at the material itself in isolation and then we look at your work, I think we, we start to put that question together. But it's obviously you've had a very major input into um, yeah. that, that, that. So um, I guess I'm interested in what, what level the material plays in that discussion with you um, or whether it's other influences that, uh, that, that you're bringing into it as well. Uh, you mean the material played the position in my artwork? And what's the position? Of yeah, or your, 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 your um, ability in, in, uh, in unfolding that cultural story, I guess. Yeah. How much um, do you think you're relying on the material to do that? And how much are, are you, as an artist, you know, impacting that? You know? so it's a pretty obvious question when you look at your work. But hmm. <laughs> I think um, when I play with material, I actually now ask uh, what it's... Uh, what are jewelry material? I'm asking what material can do. And this material is come from a kitchen duty. It's an uh, obvious uh, woman's duty in Taiwanese culture, especially in the kitchen. Yep. And I think that it's uh, the important part of my research because all my research is focused on gender study and how female reflect out their daily life. And that is why I picked this material, because I think it carries the, the story not only from our culture, it's also from our labor life, our everyday life, how we practice every day, not only in our work, also in our daily duty. Yeah. yeah and the material and gender are uh, an interesting discussion yeah. for you. <laughs> Yeah. And, and also, um, Min Yufang, um, would you talk about labour involved yeah. in that as well in relation to, um, you know, the activities of the household and also, um, you know, the delicacy of weaving and the intensity of weaving? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Mm. Yeah. And also, before I become a jeweller, I study textile. So textiles. Yeah, oh. so textile is also part of my history. Yeah. Okay, thank you, um, Yu yeah. Fang. Uh, thank you, Michael, for reminding me that the time is up. Uh, <laughs> Barbara. The, the assistant Wait. timekeeper. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, thank you. I enjoyed that. Um, I'm going to start with a question, and really it's a question to everybody on the table and probably in the audience too. But the question is, uh, before I show the work, what are the ethics 
of appropriating the material of another artist's artwork to make a new work? So that's a question to each one of you. And I'm very lucky that I was in 1991, Helen was in Kalgoorlie where I was in Kalgoorlie. And that's where she started her career, I think, her start work with um, jewellery, being a printmaker before, a textiles artist, but where she started. And um, what she gave to me, and it was a great privilege, was one of her early works that uh, combines um, this little um, fossil together with, um, on the side we see um, a CD, mm -hmm. uh, um, a, a board, um, what do you call them? A circuit. Circuit board, thank you. Um, silver and acrylic and held together in this little circle. And it's so precious to me, it's so precious to me that I don't even <coughs> dare wear it. Oh, that's a shame. Um, that, so it comes to me, and I'm a painter, and in the painting world, what it, would it mean for somebody to use my painting and paint over it, and, you know, because many artists have, and of course Duchamp wanted to put Mona Lisa on the ironing table and iron it. So the question to each one of you is, what for you are the, would, how would you feel the ethics of somebody else, some other person taking your jewellery, appropriating it, and using it as material? That's a, mm. loaded, it's a loaded question. It's, it's and certainly I, one for Helen, because it's I, Helen's piece. Yeah, <laughs> and, I, and it happens, it's, it actually yeah, I happens, think, um, oh. sorry, yeah. sorry, you go ahead. No, I was just no, going to no, say, it fine. actually happens every day within the jewellery um, yeah. practice and within mm. the jewellery world that you, every, I mean, every, every discipline has yeah, and, aspects of it. But especially in relation to remaking of rings or, you know, because someone actually originally made that. Yeah. You might not know the artist mm. person. No, but this is where knowing, the, uh, knowing, knowing yes. the artist. So it's about yeah. the knowing artist. And it's not, you know, yeah. we all, we all yeah. appropriate ideas, yes. but yeah. it's actually taking this work yeah. Mm. Yeah. And, yeah. and using this as mm. material. But that would happen. So, Helen, Helen that's happened yeah. to you, I'm sure, mm. in your career. What do you think about Oh, that? well, you rise, just rise above it and move yeah. on. <laughs> um, yeah, look, I have so I'm very, very touched because I didn't know what Barbara was bringing. So this, mm. is, and we haven't actually seen each other for a long time. So it's quite yeah. an emotional moment. And yes, it is a piece of one of probably one of the earliest works that I made yes. in jewellery, which yeah. I haven't seen since yeah. about 1991. So it's like, yeah, so give me that. So <laughs> wonderfully related to what, what yeah. some of your um, current ideas that you're yeah, working perhaps, with. I don't know, yeah. but it's fantastic. I've totally yeah. forgotten that it exists. So <laughs> it's really yeah. fantastic. Would you like a tissue? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I've got my little hanky. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, it is... I think it is interesting, uh, you know, I, you know, p people do, of course, I think we're talking really about the material itself the material and not itself, the idea not or the, the form. That's right. Mm. And uh, I think, you know, it's a really interesting problem. I, what I always, just trying spontaneously to think of examples, one of the saddest examples, and this happens particularly in Europe and I'm sure in Australia, is mm. that people bring in their old gold jewellery to have it melted down and sell the gold. And as a consequence, a huge amount of very valuable historical material just gets recycled, mm. uh, melted down. It's gone. The history's mm. gone. The making, the history of making, this is, of course... Um, very, very problematic, but it's been, I mean, it's, it's been going on, I mean, look at what the Spanish did in South America with all that amazing stuff. I mean, there's many, many examples. Mm. I mean, I live in Germany, there's a fairly nasty history of it there as well. Mm. So, um, that's kind of one aspect. On the other hand side, you know, it, you know how much of it do we hang on to and how much, you know, what is the life of our work anyway? You know, is it does it have a life that's actual and now and relevant to people and then can it move on and become something else? Do we, you know, can it have a new life as a component of another piece of, we're talking about jewellery, but it may even be an old car, you know, if we want to, ex it seems like... And, and I think know. it's a question that, um, that it's also, um, you need to perhaps 
put it into context. So because, you know, as a teacher um, with students, um, this idea of using a material is how they gain knowledge and mm. how they actually develop their own voice. So mm. this, this idea around well, appropriation, um, you know, might, might, might be best looked at at what, what stage in your career that, that you're at and what responsibility you have mm. um, ethically t um, in that. Because, you know, for, for, for a person just starting out, it, it, it's a really important a to, to, be, mm. to be using what's around and a way of learning, yeah. So mm. I think mm. it's, you know, we need to be very careful how we, how we um, sort of... Um Does it also... Sorry, go ahead. I was just, you know, like, in a way, like, there's a couple of things in terms of mm. this appropriation of another artist's work as material for your own work. That, mm. That's sort of quite different to, um, you know, sort of just thinking about material like gold or whatever, because mm. embedded in the artist's material then is the ideas and... You know, the intellectual prop, all those sorts of things. Sure. And I yeah. think that, because um, kind of just Helen following on from what you're saying about, I mean, you know, like I love history and things and just the tragedy of things being lost. But at the same time, there's this sort of joyousness then about materiality, you know, the material sort of yeah. kind of being able to transform and mm. so on. So, yeah. It, so, can mm. I just finish by asking, is it about whether it's um, attributed or not? Yeah. Is it, does it lie in the ethics of whether you acknowledge whether you've adopted something into your work? And we might have to answer that question after mm. the... Yeah, after it's the, a good question. Yeah, that is a very good question. Remember Sorry. it. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. We're, um, <laughs> Kirsten, if you wouldn't... Um, share us with your questions. Well, okay. well today um, I, I'm really interested in the, the elements of jewellery and I'm really interested in um, the way that um, jewellery is made up of so many multiple elements. So it could be, um, it could be theoretical in terms of its, um, you know, its ideas, its design, um, how it comes together, how it's made. Um, but it but it can also be about the materials. And so quite often when I um, think about material, I might think about it as um, quite a, um, like a, a simple form to start with. So today I brought um, sand with me. And so my sand can go through this funnel. Um, and so my sand was collected from... Um, a beach in Auckland, and it's um, black sand. Look at that beautiful and photography. I think it's um, what I think about with sand is maybe I should ask my questions, but I just wanted to mention um, someone like William Blake, who says, you know, um, the world in a in a grain of sand. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's just being a jeweler and working with things that are small. But my questions are, how do elements function? And also, in what ways can I shape material, and in what ways can it shape me? Mm. And did you bring your other element? Oh, um, which was my other element? Oh, I've got another exciting. I've got another exciting element. So what I'd like to say, maybe <laughs> more about the sand, <laughs> is that it's actually magnetic sand. So, wow. so the thing about this sand. Sorry, now I'm just going to get into material. You know, mm. excitement. But the thing about this sand is it's actually um, it's iron sand yeah. and it's the beach that I collected it from is next to the, um, the steel mill that is probably one of the only steel mills in the world that makes iron from sand. Yeah. And so, it's, so what's amazing about it is it's just so magnetic and it's so full of iron. It's 80% iron. Wow. But we, you know, it's part of the land and I'm very interested in <laughs> materials that are part Sorry. of the land. <laughs> up your nose. And also, <laughs> and also, <laughs> oh, I hope Sorry. not. And also materials that, that come from, you know, they're, 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 in, the, they're in the planet. They, they form, you know, steel is, you know, and iron is 80% of the, of the planet. And then, and then we, we can use this as an elementary form to make lots of other things. But... I think everyone else should respond to my questions. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, mm. yeah. yeah I, I think, you know, I mean, we, we tend to... Um, I think one of the things new materialism has mm. talked about, the activity of the material as a co-agent and a co-creator. Um, but this work, I think, exemplifies it in a way that 
you know, sometimes I think we pay lip service to the agency yeah. of the material yeah. and what it offers. But in this one, the, the, the material really is obstinate in asserting its agency. It's ra yeah. really rather beautiful. Yeah. And it's almost, I mean, with, I think when I went to, we all did it science at uh, school, we had um, iron filings and then we had a magnet. And that's kind of most lasting impression on how the activity of the invisibility uh, made visible. The quality it's beautiful. of the material. Yeah. 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 And that sand can kind of look fluffy. Yeah. I mean, that's also a remarkable yeah. quality. Yeah. I mean, it looks fluffy from here. Yeah. So that that oh, you other can get lost on YouTube. The other yeah. material, <laughs> the other material that um, you know that um, you know that that makes me come to think of sand in this way or this type of sand is is ice, and that's from you know working a lot with ice, and so thinking about ice maybe as you know one sort of one structure and how it might build to create much larger landscapes and structures so mm. that materials can build landscape but they can be also used to build jewelry objects so mm. um yeah so potentially could you wear something that is oh i could actually because i've got i could actually put this on that's what i was wondering. but the other thing that um is quite mm. um i mean these objects are made from steel and enamel so I chose my objects to put my sand in because the object is made from steel and it's coated with actually sand because glass is enamel and this is and this is also sand and so glass is made you know from um, from sand and that's how the earliest glass was made um, so I think that sand you know, in its simple form, has so much to, to offer to us. And so I could actually wear this as a jewellery object as well. Okay, so while you're wearing that, <laughs> yep. uh, we'll, we'll go on just to the next, on there. next question. And, um, and I'll just pop myself in the bag. If anyone would like one, you can pop over. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. Thank, Thank, okay. Thank you for that um, yeah, very nice. engaging material experience. Now, Helen. Okay. Thanks. I'll get the camera. Um, I want to talk about my material. Uh, I'm just traveling through. I live in Germany, so it was a matter of what was in my suitcase. And that would also be appropriate. And what interests me about materials... Uh, is the stories they tell, where they come from and what they're connected to. So uh, in my suitcase, I've been up at the North Coast doing some research on my family. And my dear cousin, uh, who I'm very close to, is a great fisherwoman. And she had um, caught a couple of mulloway uh, off the coast, off the, uh, off the groin where she lives uh, in northern New South Wales and scaled them and collected all the scales off them and washed them and dried them for me and put them in a big box because she thought I might like to have them, uh, which is fairly indicative of what happens to me when I visit my family when <laughs> I come to Australia. And that has an interesting history because um, I also fish myself and it's a very important activity for me. So having left my country and being based in Germany for a number of years now, one of the activities that I've been doing that is an extension of what I do since my childhood was to take particular materials that were important to me and then use them to make very private um, meditative objects. So the fish scales also for example, have, I've used them, and my cousin, of course, knows this, um, to make various large-scale works. <coughs> um, and my question is, was initially a very blunt question, is it jewellery? But it's more, the, more like, when does it become jewellery and why could it be jewellery and what makes a piece of jewellery jewellery and not something else? But I don't want to... I want to kind of go on with my story about the fish scales because it's a, it's a wonderful way for me 
what I'm interested in, what materials do, is of course co they, this connects me to a deeply personal history. It connects me to my country, to my landscape, to the things I love to eat, and I love to eat fish that I catch myself or that are caught by my family. Um, there are wonderful stories that then go off that in a whole network. My, my cousin's father-in-law was also a great fisherman and he fished for this exact fish off the wall last time I was here. Um, in between, uh, he was a pensioner and lived on a very modest income. So in my catalogue, what I also have, I took a lot of photographs of... Um, he would catch fish and fillet them and sell the fillets to the local fish shop uh, to substitute his pension. Now, while I was away back in Germany in between, with 85, he went and caught an enormous mull away off the edge of the groin, pulled it out of the water, had a massive heart attack and died, oh. which of course was a blessing because what a better way to go. So the scale of the mull away, um, formerly known in Australia as a Jewfish, not because of its religious leanings, but because in fact it has two jewels in the sides of its head, its head, which I also have a collection of because people give me these things when I come here. And this goes right back to my childhood. So this simple material, this strange um, little flake, uh, 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 remarkable in itself, uh, uh, fish, I don't know if you know fish scales, uh, uh, they don't shed their scales, they actually are, you probably can't see it well enough here, it's called a cycloid scale, and they actually have rings around and around and around like a tree. So if you have a look at one closely, you can also tell how old the fish is by the rings in its scale. Now, genetically, uh, scale, we're linked to fish scales, it's the same gene that creates uh, hair and teeth. So, there, I, and this is what interests me very much about materials, and it's also a question of our responsibility because every single thing that we pick up has a history and an impact on the planet, and I think we're only just starting to understand that. So, when I pick up a material, it immediately uh, bursts into this network of stories, connections, and possibilities of what I'm aware of, what am I holding in my hand, where it's come from, all of these kinds of things. But to get back to my question, you know, when, as we see, you know, any materials possible, you can talk, you can, particularly as kind of academically trained people, we can talk up anything into a piece of jewellery. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, where does that mean anything goes? Can anything be jewellery? You know, is this um, object that I made with all the scales of the first snapper that I had to buy at the fish market in Munich because I was so desperate for a fish and then had the challenge of trying to clean my first fish in an apartment. Uh, and so I carefully collected up all the scales, glued them onto silk with a little dob of red paint and made uh, this object that you could hang around your neck, but would you and would it survive? So that, that's my question. And thank you very much. Um, <laughs> the, um, yeah, it wasn't conditional that um, we had to answer the question. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Helen. It's also um, something to lovely, contemplate. Yeah, a lovely story, a narrative, but also um, the idea of research too in material. I mean, you, you, you've, you've obviously um, you know, done, investigated that very, very thoroughly. Nick? I really like this. So like from a a natural plastic to a manufactured yeah. plastic, I always put I've actually got three together. objects because I feel I have to talk about uh, them together. The first object I have is a plastic toy action figure, Bespin Luke from um, 1980 um, from the Star Wars uh, franchise. And then I have a wooden object, um, a leg which I've carved to uh, not replicate that object, but to create my own version of um, an action figure. And then this object, which is a plastic casting that I created from an original object that I produced to look like um, an elephant ear. Um, but it wasn't actually a replica of an actual plastic elephant ear. And the reason why I have to I chose Best and Luke is because it's not so much about, for me, it's not that the, the notion this is plastic is connected to the narrative, and that's incredibly important, because when you're talking about a filmic narrative, 
um, which is you can, like such as Star Wars, but any sort of filmic narrative um, or literal narrative, you can approach it visually, emotionally, intellectually, but you can't touch that narrative. You can't physically be part of it. And this object, this toy, actually allows a tangible accessibility to a narrative by um, creating an object that it connects to. So that's why I'm interested in that object, but I'd never use an actual object like that in my work. Um, for me then, the idea of then hand carving something or sculpting something is the process is, a, I guess, a reverence to that material plastic and the idea of capturing a narrative and um, object, but then to make a mould of this later and then to make my own replica of my original materials in plastic kind of, um, again, relates back to this original object. So for me, the notion of using plastic, and not, not all, I don't <coughs> use plastic in all my works, um, it's about a, I guess, very much an appreciation of that material and an acceptance of its longevity. Because in this particular sense, I want these pieces to <coughs> last. So my question is, has the social hierarchy of material value, particularly in terms of contemporary jewellery, changed in the last couple of decades? And if so, how? <coughs> so talking more, I guess, more in the ten, last 10 years or so, because um, obviously in the history of contemporary jewellery from the 60s, 70s, 80s, there was incredible change in terms of what jewellery could be um, made from. But in the last... 10 years, I'm wondering if there is a different approach to materials like plastic and whether it's a switch back, um, particularly in terms of the environment, I suppose. Nick, is it part of a, a sort of a longer history around um, finding materials? I mean, it's very interesting. Kirsten's picking materials from a beach. Um, the, the notion that, in fact, often our materiality must surely be related to our situatedness. So then it's what we want to do with it. But is is if you take a very long time frame and you go back 50,000 years possibly, then your leg, which you've carefully carved out of wood, might look at all strange to someone who's in a very significant role as a, as a craftsperson, as a maker, as a jeweller potentially. Hmm. So, you know, simply throwing that out there, that what, what time frame are you thinking of in terms of... Oh, what, what so I, yeah, look, yeah, I'm not, you know... Um I hadn't actually got a specific time frame in terms of that. <laughs> um, I mean, for me, the leg is actually not the important part. It's actually this. And of course, I don't have the original elephant ear that I um, carved or sculpted. I can't remember how I actually made the original elephant ear, but this is actually what's important in many ways. This is a process um, which, um, for me, I guess that, that I, I don't know, that process is somehow important to actually have that, that connection with the material and the hands-on. I would never just cast a, an, a, another object that's an existing object. For me, that's, I don't know, there's no kind of um, connection to the material, maybe? I, I don't know. Um, it's also kind of interesting, too. It makes me think of, you know, following on from your comment, Michael, you know, like, just, it's interesting to think through, like, um, the selection and use of materials, like, at different times throughout millennial millennia in terms of making jewelry you know what is what is at hand or what you know is it what's at hand or what gets selected as having value and mm. and being brought in to make jewelry or you know it's mm. it's really really interesting question and I guess I was just also following on from that was just um, Barb's reference to new materialism earlier on and you know just I guess just wondering there as well, you know, whether there's any kind of sort of pickup on that within contempt, well, within jewellery making, around the idea of materials with agency, you know, like I think, which is also what you're talking about. Yeah, it's an interesting question because, um, yeah, in many ways, um, new materialism to a jeweller is um, 50,000 years old. I mean, um, we've always dealt with with the notion of material having agency. And, and it's probably um, um, a, a challenge for, for us as makers in, in our field of, you know, loosely described as craft, to actually, you know, even own that position a little bit more, you know, because yeah. um, but it's I something think, that's embedded. I don't, 
Yeah, I don't think it's embedded, actually. Oh, that's the end of that. <laughs> okay, Michael, it's your turn. <laughs> All right, here I have my piece, and it, it, is, um, it operates at a number of levels. It's um, an integrated chip. It's an LED, so it's light emitting, so it actually has a function which is to display. Um, it's not what I wanted. Um, what I want is a, trans a flexible, translucent, organic LED strip or element. Um, so this sits as part of a con an ongoing transformation. So this is made of silicon, it's, and, and its etchedness, of course, comes back from a series of processes that found their origins in very early metalworking and would go back to the, literally the beginning across the globe of um, different kinds of, of jewellery and, and artefact making practices. So this is just part of this journey. And as I say, uh, the item that I wanted is not currently available. Um, can you uh, make it? You can. You need, you need a fair amount of equipment. Um, equipment's very important for uh, making things. But um, this requires, uh, to make um, organic LEDs requires uh, very extreme equipment. Um, but the thing that's fascinating uh, uh, for me is that this is in a kind of large, it's a loop of transformation about transformation. Mm -hmm. Because where this is going is with a flexible, translucent um, or transparent organic LED system or, or, or membrane, you can apply it to skin, you can apply it to any surface. Mm -hmm. uh, but what you can do now is assign each element of this, of this material with a... Um, with a particular identity. So you can convert this into a gel. So you can smear this onto a surface, onto the human body, and it becomes a screen. So if I think about the role of, of um, making for human beings, what I think about is transformation. That from the very beginning, whether it was dance, whether it's music, whether it's red ochre, we as a species are preoccupied by this notion of transformation. We want to be something else, and it, def and it literally defines our, our being in a way. So that and collaboration. So whether it's cities, whether it's a very a, a tiny, um, you know, a, a tiny piece that's worn, or whether or not it's even thinking about a phenomenon like, like magnetic sand mm -hmm. and wanting to transform that into something which somehow that fits within a kind of mm -hmm. a notion of who we might be, so my question really just revolves around this idea of is ah uh, culture you know the, the the if transformation is fundamental to what it is to be human then in a way when we talk about boundaries between say art or or sculpture or city making god help us urban planning and the making of jewelry in a way what do we mean by that if if in many respects there's a fundamental urge which which we seem to be unable to check. So irrespective of where we are on the planet, we're driven by the same thing. And I just think that that's the most interesting thing about our making and that the making makes us. And I'm not, I'm not quite sure what the, the significance is of the, different, of the boundary conditions that we apply to this profound impulse that we that almost shapes who we are? That's my question. Mm. Mm. Yeah, well, that's got its... <laughs> you might have to answer your own question. Well, I mean, I, I, I'm, I think uh, uh, that making is, making is what actually is the, transforms us. And I think we're seeing in contemporary neuroscience for the first time, we're being able to scan that. But I think if you've been a maker, you know that all along. Yeah, and yeah, I think all yeah. we've, mm. you know, what we hear around the table is yeah. these fantastic stories about transformation. And in that too, and in and how how we make, you know, we have to be uh, mindful of what we make, because mm. we can make a lot of things that are really irrelevant mm. or, um, you know, or have yeah really yeah. bad consequences, yeah. you know, for um, the planet and for the environment. For ethically, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but, but that transformation things. continues though, because as Susie yeah. pointed out, at the, you know, at the outset, the pieces that she's wearing and she's identified yeah. who's made them, yeah. they've all they're all transformed by Susie mm. wearing them. I mean, the mm. materiality or is shifting. They, they transform me by the way. And they transform you. I mean. That's yeah, right. Yeah. So mm. it's. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 
So yeah, it's a, it, but, um, it, it, it's a continual kind of interwoven. Yeah, and, and that's I mean that's how we engage with materials, and that's how we learn from materials is by them mm. actually affecting us as well mm. as mm. we work with them because we understand mm. what they can do, and it changes or it opens mm. up new avenues of direction that we might take. Absolutely, or someone like Lambros Melothoros would say that one's ability, a human, mm. a, the human ability to think abstractly and project beyond what is in front of us through the process of making. Mm. Mm. But there's oh, also, I mean, there's that, but I think coming back to what you were saying before, I mean, coupled with that, I mean, makes me think of power relations and with gold. Mm. I mm. mean, yeah. you know, like, so it's not just being sensitive to materiality, no, no. it's actually sort of controlling it. Yeah. Mm. And, you know, like this, the, the, the kind of extraordinary journeys that a piece of, like, like the extraction of gold mm. through to jewellery mm. makes. Or, you know, like there's, um, oh gosh, uh, the work that was at the NGV with the Triennale or, you know, just, is it former? Fantas uh, yeah, Fantasma. Yeah, former Fantasma, like around, mm. I think it was them, you know, with the Three mobile three. chip, you know, mm. like that that's there and just the huge kind of sort of processes and everything mm. that goes yeah. into making that. Thank you, Michael. You and always L do Louise. Is, we're running <laughs> we're running a little bit at three minutes over time. Is that uh, okay? I'll be quick. Yeah. I, I'm this is a proposition. I'm testing this. I'm not sure what's going to happen. I'm thinking about um, if something is entirely ephemeral, what are the conditions that it allows me to experience it as a piece of jewellery? Or I could go further, but I'm not going to with the time. <sighs> And I'm going to be, yes, you please, because I don't want to get it. Would you like me to sprinkle you? Uh, yeah, I can kind of sprinkle you. Yeah. So it's, it's a collaborative oh. piece. <laughs> Where's the, oh. And I've already disrupted it yeah. because I can't control the conditions for the work to be made in these circumstances. But it's also, well, how long do I expect this to adhere to my skin? Does it necessarily have to be part of my body for it to exist as a piece of jewellery? How does it make me feel? How do I manoeuvre in relation to things in the world if I'm going to use something that's um, entirely ephemeral? It, I suppose I could ask all the questions that have already been discussed, really, in relation to it as an idea. And maybe it's not this iteration of something as a gesture that um, will strike and or have potential for... It, it has potential for something else. It makes me think about... As a, I don't know what that is, as a painter, <laughs> you know, can I use this as an idea that might relate to something in context with painting or what painting could be, but also as um, someone who loves objects to be worn by the body or sculpture to be worn by the body, I don't necessarily wear things that are um, beautiful necessarily or are about simply ornamentation. I didn't wear very much jewellery today. <laughs> I have bought something that, um, to, I've worn something that was a gift and it's Tibetan and I was told that it's copper and it's from the 1700s but it, it may also, I was advised that it was also containing elements of a meteorite. <laughs> so I love the idea that I can't be sure but I choose to believe that it's from another planet <laughs> or another, another rock <laughs> travelling through the universe, then maybe that's where I'll return to one day. <laughs> and that's kind of the life cycle of this <laughs> gesture. <laughs> gesture as well. <laughs> I don't know where it's returning to. <laughs> um, but that's, but that's got you know, a strong... Um, resonance with the idea of mm. you know ceremonial, yeah. Uh, you know, it's so about it's ceremony, you know, that ritual, celebration, yeah, celebration. Because yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. um, I, I bet there'd be a bunch of um, four or five year olds in a bath well, if you introduced that as a concept. <laughs> along with this, it would, could well, be life, when absolutely you're the life changing. Most inventive as well. Quite often, when you you don't um, impose boundaries on your mm. thought processes or your creativity or thinking about what's possible, like what is possible if you, you know, all of a sudden I was thinking, well, I could 3D print it, I could, you know, um, turn it into a screen and I could be projecting things into it or onto it or on into some other place in the world through this idea of it con conducting, um, you know, ideas. Or I could just say that it's something in an entirely different material, that it has, you know, incredible, unique 
positive um, material qualities that because I say say it is and I believe it is and there all of a sudden it's it's become something entirely magical and I like how you have to become it like yeah. you can't ignore it you know well it's how I hold it in relation to my body I could you know I could yeah. interact with it more yeah. you know we could, we could brush up against each I other I could have mag oh, oh you could put some on your um, I could on your sand. no I won't put it on your face <laughs> but I could magnetise sand and can we put a bit of sand on it <laughs> I don't know how it'll behave, but you know, I, I just think they're all, it's creating, um, it's highlighting different qualities about the material now, the fishes and the, uh, the tiny little occlusions that the foam has created and still growing and transforming and becoming, and the, um, you know, the, it has... It's also telling you what to do. Well, it yeah, is. Yeah. I could enforce my will yeah, you, upon you it, could. but I won't because I choose yeah. to allow yeah. it to have its own life form now. <laughs> do, you, do you think, I mean, what's mm. interesting is the mm. idea of it as well, the idea mm. of using the foam to put yeah. on your body in a different way than its mm. um, original Intended purpose. purpose. So and for me, that's how my yeah. ideas, um, yeah. when I have, I know it's a great idea, I know it's because it's evolved in that way that I've thought of what else it could be. Yeah often totally um, alien from its original or intended purpose and that's when magic happens. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, um, we had intended to um, ask questions but we have run out of time. Actually, it was quite deliberate really. Um, but if you, if you would like to ask um, questions, we'll be around. I'm happy to, happy to. So uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming. Uh, absolutely thank all the participants today. Um, hopefully we're... <laughs> have um, scratched the surface of, uh, of the importance of material in, in our thinking and our practices. So thank you.